Welcome to the Flourish Podcast with Dr. Tony Ingram, where you will hear straight from some of the best practitioners and leaders in wellness on how to take control of your family's physical, spiritual, and mental health, because we are all designed to flourish. As a reminder, this show is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Nothing said on the Flourish Podcast should be taken as medical advice. For your own specific medical advice, please always consult with your own healthcare providers. Now, on today's show, we have Brian Marr. Brian is a co-founder of Bristle Health. He received his BA in International Business from the University of San Diego. After receiving his degree, Brian spent seven years in the commercial organization at Illumina, driving adoption of genomic technology and applications into new and emerging markets. Brian then joined Twist Bioscience to manage the growth of their genomic sequencing business in Northern California. He has a passion for applying novel technology in healthcare to improve patient outcomes. All right. Well, Brian, welcome to the Flourish podcast. I'm so excited to have you on. Uh, I've been looking forward to this for a long time, so I'm glad you're here. Thank you so much for having me. Um, You know, I always love our conversations and getting to know you and the team. So uh, excited to do it on the podcast. And uh, yeah, I've been looking forward to it. Can't wait to dig in. Fabulous. Yeah. Now our audience can get to know you guys, too. Um, so tell us, we're going to, we're going to get to bristle, but start with, start with Brian, uh, (laughs) tell us about yourself, where you grew up, where you went to school and and what was your former life before this whole startup adventure? Yeah. As you know, it's hard to dissociate Brian from bristle and I'm sure yourself from flourish, uh, once you get started, but we'll take a step out. Um, so born and raised in Southern California, um, grew up. Basically, every day, summer would be at the beach from when I was a baby, um, always doing some kind of sports. So I was always been really outdoorsy person, um, which, you know, carries on through now. Um, then attended the University of San Diego. Um, I was a business major, had no intention of getting into science or genetics or anything like that, but kind of tripped and fell into the genetic space. Um, San Diego's huge bio hub or a huge biotech hub. So, um, plenty of opportunity there. And, um, yeah, I mean, from there just really fell in love with science and kind of the field. Um, you know, I'm going to immediately veer into work because that's in how I think, but, um, you know, it, it really became like a consuming passion of understanding these breakthroughs we were making and understanding how our DNA and other factors impact, not just disease, but, you know, our overall health. And it it was really addicting being at the ground level of the company that called Illumina that made DNA sequencers um, and getting to see things like cancer genomics, reproductive health, and of course the microbiome. Um, but, you know, always took a lot of pride in my work. Um, as you know, things kind of reach a new level when you start your own company. Um, yeah, outside of that, just... I uh, always have a lot of different hobbies. Um, I'm actually in Vail right now, about to go skiing. So as we were talking about rough life, but you know, yeah, gotta yeah. so fun. rough. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. So you're, so you started out as a business major. Does that mean you, so were you into science at all before that, or it really wasn't until college? Yeah. I mean, I always was interested in science um, growing up, you know, our, my mom was a science nerd and um, you know, I always loved math and things, but I didn't really see research as being where I wanted to go. I saw myself more on the business side. Um, but yeah, it was, and it was my mom's influence as well, where she had just called me. I was looking for internships. She was listening to the radio and somebody was talking about DNA sequencing. And, um, you know, when you talk to moms, they just tend to ramble, tell you about everything they did that day, um, which I love. And she mentioned it she's like, you need to go find company doing this. And I was like, yeah, 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 whatever. And then sure enough on the job board, I was looking at, there was a company doing DNA sequencing. So went in kind of lied my way through my interview, but made it in. Um, and yeah, from there really just kind of fell in love with the space. Awesome. Awesome. Oh, that's so cool. I love it. 
Uh, And now you're in Southern California still, right? I'm actually in Denver now. So relocated recently. Okay. Uh, Okay. Yeah. Very excited to be here. Awesome. Awesome. So tell us a little bit about Bristle and what the test is. Yeah. So Bristle is really a platform to try to give patients and clinicians a deeper understanding of their oral health. Um, and, you know, a big part of that is identifying the root cause of different oral conditions, um, all through looking at the oral microbiome. Um, when I say oral microbiome, I'm referring to all of the bacteria and fungi that live in the mouth. Um, and specifically our test, uh, we developed, it's a saliva test that can identify and measure all 700 plus unique bacteria and fungi in the mouth. Um, and then from that, uh, offer personalized recommendations to help try and improve a person's oral health. Awesome. So I, and I don't know if, if everyone knows that clarification or not, but you would consider fungi to be part of the microbiome, right? Yeah, absolutely. It, a lot of times microbiome tends to get conflated with just the bacteria, but yeah. you know, what we're really interested in, and I think what research really supports is um, it's really an ecosystem. So we know there's different abundances of things uh, in the mouth and, you know, you can see instances and you can imagine, um, you know, we tend to use garden analogies a lot at Bristle. Um, it tends to help clarify the picture um, where, you know, if you're just looking at the bacteria, but we have a garden that's full of candida albicans or full of fungi, you know, if you're just measuring the bacteria, you could be missing a huge percentage of what's actually going on. Um, so really, you know, you're going to hear a theme when me talking about bristle about balance and community, but, um, you know, we think that's a component of it. Viruses are another component that, you know, we're starting to understand, but, um, you know, largely with bristle, what we're looking at right now are the fungi and bacteria. Awesome. So does that, I mean, we'll, we'll talk about what's coming down the pike a little bit later in the interview, but yeah. am I hearing that maybe viruses might be part of the testing in the future? At some point in the future, uh, we would be very excited to be able to offer that. Um, you that know, would I, be super I, cool. Yeah, nothing to announce right now, but you know, something cool. Darn, I thought we could maybe get a, a leg up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so how and why? Um, I I know a little bit about your motivation, but and, and I know you're not the only founder either. So how did how and why did you and the other founders start Bristle? Yeah. So originally the idea for Bristle, um, you know, kind of taking a step back before Bristle. Um, so Danny's our CEO, my original co-founder, um, we were both working in the genetics and genomics space and we got to see all this incredible work being done. You know, we were working with startups, bigger companies, researchers who were just doing things that seemed like magic with, um, with the technology, you know, detecting cancer from a blood draw or things like non-invasive prenatal testing, where again, from a blood draw of the mother, you can start to get insights into the health of the um, pregnancy. And, you know, another big space we kept seeing was the microbiome. Um, And so we were always looking for where were opportunities that we could apply this technology um, to further improve different areas of healthcare. Because we really believe genomics is going to be one of the biggest revolutions we'll see. Um, oral health, ironically, um, became the target because I've struggled with my oral health. Um, I'm someone who, you know, had bad teeth growing up, but would, you know, admittedly didn't take the best care when I was younger. But, you know, as I got older, I really tried to resolve my issues and kept seemingly having problems. And it didn't really make sense that, I could be wearing a continuous glucose monitor. I could get my gut tested. I could get all these different tests. But when trying to look at the underlying root cause of oral health, there really wasn't a tool accessible. Um, So we really latched onto that idea. We were really lucky to meet our other two co-founders, David and Shivam. David being a a microbiology PhD um, who had studied the gut microbiome and the neural connection. And uh, from there, you know, Bristle was born. Awesome. I I didn't realize that you had those similar, some of the struggles that so many 
of my patient struggle with too. So, and I'm, and I'm guessing when you went to the dentist and you had yet another cavity or your gums were bleeding again, and it was the same old story, what did they tell you when you were in the dental office? I mean, yeah, it was, you nailed it. It was the, you know, some people just have bad teeth and it's genetic, um, which I was like, you know, we work in genetics. We should be able to figure this out if it is genetic. Um, But, you know, I I was not an uncommon case where you'll see family members having very different outcomes and very different experiences, which, you know, would usually point to it. Maybe it's not just genetic. Um, And, you know, as I dug in and as we learned more and more, uh, we realize that's not the case. Uh, and they probably like when you ask, Doc, what can I do to fix this? Do I just have bad teeth? And then they usually give this or the hygienist will give the same old answer. Oh, you just need to brush better and floss a little bit more. Right. And maybe do some more fluoride. That's it. Spot on. And yeah. you know, I think that's one of well, you know, I think we'll get to this later in the conversation about what people should know, but education is just such a massive problem. I think in understanding, you know, from the patient side, since starting Bristol, I have learned so, so, so much more. And I think a big theme of it is that uh, oral health doesn't stop with brushing and flossing. You know, there's how, uh, you know, I always have a lot of water with me because I know hydration is a big component of it. Diet's a big component of it and not just sugar, you know, sugar gets all the focus, but goes beyond that breathing, things like that. So, uh, yeah, I think you nailed it. I had that kind of, I think, cliche patient experience where it's, you aren't getting the answers you're looking for and it can be extremely demotivating. For sure. For sure. And then you're the type of person who said, screw this, I'm going to find the answer (laughs) and created a whole company around it, which is really awesome. So all of us get to reap the benefits of you and your business partners. So I'm super grateful for you guys. I think it's just awesome. Um, and I know that, so you're, you're not the only saliva test that looks at the oral microbiome, uh, but your technology is a little bit different. So tell me what technology Bristle uses to test the oral microbiome and how does that compare to some of the other saliva tests that are out there currently? Yeah. So most tests use PCR, which is, you know, you might be familiar with it or your audience from COVID testing. Um, it's a really great tool for measuring a handful of targets. Um, so if you know exactly which species you're interested in, um, and only have a handful of them, it's really great for that. Um, we use a newer technology. It's called shotgun metagenomics, which is a mouthful unintended, but as the name implies, shotgun means we're analyzing everything from the saliva sample instead of just a few. Um, there's... A number of reasons we do this, but one of them is to just get that more comprehensive understanding of a patient's oral microbiome health um, and really try to deliver more insights than you can get from just looking at a handful. Yeah. And it, and that's what I've seen as a practitioner too, is the amount of data that's available from a bristle test is so much more. Uh, and so, so I, I think that's one big thing, but but tell me from your perspective, why is bristle cooler or, or I don't know, maybe you're too humble to say better, but what makes bristle distinct? What are the distinct benefits that bristle has to offer versus some of these other saliva tests? Yeah. Um, I mean, I'd love to hear your take on it as well. Um, but you know, from our standpoint and why we took this approach, one, we believe it's more accurate in understanding a patient's health. So research is backed up and, you know, we know from elsewhere in the microbiome space in the gut, um, everywhere else that it's not just about if certain bad species are present. Um, you know, we actually see some abundance of these bad or condition associated species in healthy patients. Um, and a big piece of it really is that balance of those bad to the good and to the rest of the microbiome. Um, I mean, you can imagine two patients who have similar levels of these bad bacteria. If one of those patients has otherwise a diverse and healthy community of other bacteria and patient B has zero beneficial bacteria and just has those pathogenic species, 
you can imagine they're in very different states of health and in risk of disease progression. Um, the other cool thing is it lets us do a lot more with the data. So we can give insights beyond just oral disease. So beneficial bacteria, you know, we think is critical for accuracy, but also for patient motivation. Uh, you know, it can be very motivating to not just be working at whack a moling bad bacteria, but building up this innate defense. Um, you know, things like nitric oxide producing bacteria that play a role in our vascular and brain health. Um, and even gut impact. So bacteria that can translocate and cause inflammatory conditions in the gut, you know, and that's really just scratching the surface. We're hoping to have even more insights as we go, but, you know, I think a big piece of that is what you can connect with on your, to your patients and, um, and yeah, really help the rubber hit the road. Absolutely. And I, I think your, your reporting is really far and above the reporting that I've seen anywhere else before. It really breaks it down very simply at first where you can at a glance say, okay, this is what's going well in my mouth and this is what's not going well in my mouth. And then if you want, if you, if you're wanting to nerd out, or if your dentist is looking at it, yep. then you really can get into the nitty gritty and look at specific bacterial strains. And you're right. Like the, the gut stuff absolutely blew my mind as a dentist and as a patient, uh, just looking at my own saliva test results. Um, so it, I, I agree. I think, yes, the technology is cool because of the vast amount of information that we can have, but really the way that like, like true good millennial startups, like when you can have a beautiful piece of software that makes the reporting and makes the user experience so nice and simple and streamlined, then it's the best of both worlds, just a winning combination. So I think it's, I'm a fan. Thank you. Appreciate it. Likewise. Uh, and tell me, why is Bristle sold directly to the public instead of just to dentists and or just to dental offices? Because anybody can order a Bristle test online. Why mm -hmm. was that the decision that you guys made? Yeah. So really two reasons. Um, one is exactly what you just touched on. Um, you know, we could give so much data. We can make the report as data heavy as we want. We could tailor it just for what, you know, dentists want um, and clinicians want. But if the patient isn't seeing the value or the patient isn't getting the insights we're hoping to with that report, it really won't drive the motivation or the behavior we're hoping for. Um, you know, it, it really starts and ends with that patient experience in terms of, um, and trying to make it accessible, whether you're into microbiology or not, um, you know, getting these insights and presenting it in a manner where you can have those light bulb moments. That's really what we live for. Those light bulb moments of, oh, okay, this is a much bigger deal than I thought, or, oh, okay, I have other tools I can be doing to take control of my health. And, you know, you only have so much time with patients in the chair. You can only do so much education. Um, so we really see that as an extension there. Um, the other piece is just accessibility. Um, you know, not everyone is lucky enough to have a practice like Flourish uh, in their immediate area, um, or maybe they just haven't been connected yet. So we want to be able to give, uh, we don't want to limit it to just people who have forward thinking practitioners in their area. Um, and it also allows us to then connect people with those different types of resources. So uh, in one sense, we see it being able to be the front door to oral health for, or better oral health for a lot of these people. But um, on the other hand, getting able to cut our teeth with patients and get their feedback into the report ultimately makes the entire experience better. See what you did there. That was a good pun. Good tooth pun. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Too many of them. <laughs> okay. So break it down for a patient who, or just a random Joe Blow on the street, who's never heard of bristle, why would someone want to test their saliva? Like what are the benefits of yeah. testing? 
Yeah. So, you know, there's kind of two ways I tend to approach it. One is um, similarly to how your physician takes a blood draw because they need to be able to see things about your biology that you can't observe with just looking or just listening with a stethoscope. You know, you need that other element to really understand, are there things we're not seeing here? You know, are there contributing factors um, that we just can't measure right now? Um, and, you know, the other way, really what I get into is for people who struggle with tooth decay or gum disease or bad breath, you know, things I've all had experience with, um, you know, rather than just doing a guessing game of figuring out what's going to work for you and more often than not won't, um, why not get to the root cause of most of these conditions, which are bacteria, um, and have the simple test where then we can see, you know, is my decay being caused by bacteria? Or is it being caused by my diet or is it being caused by uh, mouth breathing or these other factors, you know, stop that guessing game that can be so painful and, uh, and trying on patients. So what would, what would you say are some of these, like, Hey, we, we didn't realize that the, this person's microbiome was off in terms of gut health, then what can bristle, how can bristle help guide their habits or guide their dental team into what they're doing di differently? Like what would be some of the nitty gritty? Okay. It's not just about brushing butter and flossing more. Like what are some of these steps that bristle can help us find? Yeah. Um, so some of them, you know, if we're looking at different bacteria related to gum disease. On one hand, we can start to see, you know, is this a patient where they're in a very advanced state of gum disease where we're going to see very rapid progression? You know, we use a zero to 10 scale. If they're at a nine or a 10 on that gum inflammation score, we need to take action soon, or we probably need to take action soon because they have a very active uh, and serious infection of the cavity. Um, versus, you know, if we see early signs of gingivitis and we're a bit on the fence, uh, you know, we're at like a six or a seven into the, so we're into the red, but not all the way severe. Maybe we can be, you know, maybe that's something we can tackle with at home interventions um, and, you know, figure out, is this a case where we can use something like plosis um, or chlorine dioxide and be a bit gentler because there are some beneficial bacteria there. So we want to instead just suppress the bad maybe incorporate a probiotic and depending on which species are there, we can figure out which probiotic strains are most effective because a little known fact is that certain probiotic strains are more effective against certain species. So we'll call that out. Um, you know, even things like, do we see a very low abundance of nitric oxide producing bacteria? So we can increase nitrate in the diet through leafy greens, um, beets, things like that. Um, and these bacteria actually, re uh, release, um, byproducts that suppress the activity of those pathogenic species. So can help just pinpoint a bit and tailor, I think, you know, on one hand, when do we need to be more aggressive versus less aggressive? What types of approaches are likely going to be most effective for the patient? Um, but, you know, across different conditions, we'll have different insights. I love that. And just for, for everybody listening, uh, whereas your normal dentist might tell you to brush better and floss more, Brian just laid out at least like five different ways that to just completely expand your thoughts of what oral health actually is. So, so yeah, we might need to take a blowtorch theoretically to your oral microbiome. Like we not might need to use some really strong antimicrobials. If, if your saliva tests look like trash and, and your gums look like trash and you've got these systemic illnesses that have a strong correlation to these certain bacteria, then, then yeah, we're going to take a, a much heavier hand therapeutically to what we're doing. But if that's not the case, then, then yeah, is, how the oral microbiome affecting your gut. Do we need to start there? Maybe mm -hmm. that's where we need to start. And then maybe it is just 
oh, we need to brush better and floss more for these specific bacteria, maybe add an oral probiotic. Um, and the probiotic information is so fascinating because there actually are, uh, what are the substances called bacteriocidins? That oh, some bacteriosins. Of the, yeah. So bacteriosins, bacteriosins yeah. that some of these probiotics release mm -hmm. that are effective against these other certain detrimental bacteria. How stinking cool is that, that we can pinpoint and use a very specific strain of bacteria that's a good bacteria to kill a very specific strain of not so good bacteria. It gives us like, y'all, do y'all realize that Brian just gave you like a hundred points of information that can <laughs> alter the course of your health forever, just right then and there. Uh, such good stuff. Good stuff. I love it. Your excitement gets me so much. So excited. Yeah. <laughs> and we're going to keep talking about it. We're going to keep talking yep. about it. Okay. So let's go back to the company itself. So I'm excited. Uh, obviously I'm excited about oral health. This stuff is yep. my jam. Uh, yep. What are some of like the beliefs, the values of Bristle? Like what does Bristle stand on? I mean, our mission is to make oral health care more accessible and more effective. Um, you know, we believe by giving patients and clinicians that missing piece of the oral health puzzle um, will enable better treatment planning at the individual level and ultimately be able to identify, you know, it's an evolving science and it's an evolving field. And, you know, as we get more data, um, we'll be able to figure out which types of interventions are most effective for different people. Um, you know, we know different patients respond to treatments differently. Uh, I'm sure every clinician listening to this right now can run through their list of those patients who just aren't responding to standard interventions. And, you know, by having more data on what's working and, you know, working with clinicians like yourself um, and understanding, you know, we worked, we did this with this patient and saw really good outcomes. We saw this with this patient, didn't it really work? We can start to look, you know, do these bacteria respond differently to this type of intervention versus this one? Um, you know, but as you know, what we always come back to at Bristol is how can we make oral health and care more effective? I love that. And you're so right. Like I, one of the goals for having this podcast and having content online is, is I know that not everybody can drive two hours to go see a biological dentist. I, it's, it's very humbling that, that many do. Uh, and we have a lot of people that travel, but that's not feasible for everybody. And so if you're, if you are getting care with a provider and, and you just don't have, or you just don't have the resources to be in a dental office as often as you would like to be, or as often as you could or should be, then absolutely this is, this is your body. It's your mouth. I think it's up to everybody to take accountability for their own health and to take their health into their own hands. Mm -hmm. So how amazing would it be if you had your own, your own power to like, you don't need a prescription. You order this test on your own. You have all of the information and let's say your test isn't what you thought it was going to be your mouth is in not so great shape or it's in worse off shape than you thought. How amazing is that? If you can take this report, bring it to your dentist and say, Hey, here's what I got. Can you help guide me through these things? And can you help me along the way? I don't know a single dentist or hygienist on the planet who wouldn't be so excited about that. Uh, and if they're not so excited about that, then you call me because I'll be excited <laughs> for you. Uh, we'll make it happen. We'll make it happen. Yes, so, we will. No, I love that. I love that. And I'm excited to hopefully partner with you guys and we'll we'll keep making oral health and just overall health more accessible to the public because that's what we need. We've all got to take charge of our our one body, our one life that we're given. A hundred percent. Couldn't have said it better. So what, going back to the company itself, you know, this yep. is, is the startup from, from good old California. 
Yep. So, and as as many startups, whether it's in healthcare, health technology, or technology, uh, it comes with these fun wild rides sometimes. So yep. what have been some of the unexpected challenges you've had since starting Bristle? Yeah. So I think, um, you know, I'll do both the founder level and then the company level. You know, the first, I think at the founder level, um, you know, I wasn't naive. I anticipated it was going to be hard and very stressful, um, as all things are. Um, and you know, that frankly, that's a part of most jobs is the stress and everything. I think what caught me a bit off guard was just that always on state, um, where, you know, a day hasn't passed over the last few years that I haven't thought about bristle in some way or another. Um, you know, I could probably go more granular than days, but we'll just leave it at that. Um, and, you know, I think you need that. I think that's your responsibility as the person who started or the people who started the company to, you know, really be doing everything to make it successful. But, um, you know, a challenge was figuring out how to make it productive and not just anxiety, you know? So when, when I'm having that time every day thinking about it, it's more focused on, you know, what are challenges we can be tackling or what are creative ways we could be thinking about this instead of just, you know, worrying that something's going to come up because something's always going to come up, but it's always going to be fine. You'll get through it. Um, at the company level, the first was kind of that point you were alluding to earlier was finding the right practitioners and the right people uh, who bought in on what we were doing. Uh, you know, we talked to every dentist we could find when we first got started. And uh, we just couldn't really seem to get past the why barrier. Um, you know, uh, people thought it was cool, but it was, you know, I, I couldn't really see how it was fitting in. We will take some ownership on that too. I'm probably wasn't conveying it all that well. Danny and I were probably way too into the science, but, you know, once we were able to connect with people like yourself and people in the community who um, really are just driven by better patient outcomes. Um, you know, that was uh, a big breakthrough for us and people who were really open to seeing things a new way and trying things differently. Um, that really opened a lot of doors to us because we were never going to be able to get the change in oral health we wanted to without the community. Um, you know, you're the ones doing it every day and have all the experience. Um, so that was a big game changer for us. I think another problem that's just systemic in the oral health field is uh, just a lack of research on effectiveness of different interventions. Um, you know, we've dug through seemingly all the available literature out there on different interventions, and we do incorporate that into the report. And as we went through, we have a lot of things we can offer, but, you know, there's still a lot of question marks about new technology or different interventions that um, we hear from all the time, you know, is this effective here? Should I be using this? Um, unfortunately, the field's just under-researched, and that's something I think systemically, you know, at the government level, we need to put more investment into because oral health and disease is uh, such a chronic problem. Um, but we've also tried to do our part in it. You know, I, I think something that's relatively well-known is that there's surprisingly little research on the effectiveness of flossing, for example. No, I think people like to cling on to that of, well, there's not even a double blind controlled study on flossing. So we like to do our own research where, you know, we took a lot of our patient samples and we do a survey when people come in and we ask them, you know, how often do you floss? And sure enough, we saw a stepwise reduction in gum inflammation bacteria as the frequency of flossing increased. Uh, and we put those out on our blog and try to share those however we can, but you know, it's to as minute as flossing to as advanced as, you know, understanding X of ozone and paroprotectrase and, you know, these newer interventions that clini clinically we're seeing good outcomes, but understanding, you know, how are they impacting the microbiome to where yeah. we can solve that problem? Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. So any, I'm, I'm curious now because I, I was not aware I was probably busy with my own startup at Fleur. I was not aware of you when you first, first started. So do you want to give any like shout outs? Like who are your, your biggest proponents early on your first early adopters that really yeah. tipped the scales in your favor? Yeah. I mean, uh, 
it, it's honestly one of our biggest wins was uh, in large part the hygiene community. I mean, we had, um, you know, finding that huge advocacy group in hygienists um, uh, has been that was really instrumental to our success. You know, even before we launched, we were lucky to connect with some incredible leaders in the hygiene community. Um, people like Kristen Reisner, who's one of our advisors, Amanda Hill, Katrina Sanders, uh, many, many more. I'm running remiss, not naming everyone, but, you know, also a um, number of leaders from the oral health community. Uh, Mona Motsafari, and she was a chief dental officer of Pennsylvania. She was extremely helpful for us when we first got started. Faculty at University of Pacific School of Dentistry, who really took the first chance with us in running that study. Um, but, you know, it's constant. You know, getting to work with people like yourself and um, and others who uh, are just really out there doing it, you know, taking the startup, doing things another way. Um, every time we could have one of those calls, like when we first got to meet you, um, I know the team was was all so excited. Awesome. Well, I that I surprised, but not surprised that. Like it makes total sense that some of your first big proponents were in the hygiene community. Uh, so as always, hygienists are, are leading the front in actual prevention. I feel like sometimes it, as dentists, we get a little tied up in restorative care, um, whether it's just because so many of us are more technical or it that's just how we make our bread and butter is by fixing teeth. Um, but man, I'm so appreciative of hygienists who lead the way and say, no, this is, this is what oral care is. This is oral health care is in these areas where we can more accurately diagnose and prevent and treat and keep people out of my chair for more dental mm -hmm. work. I, I love that. Um, and I'm glad that they lead the way. And us dentists, we're 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 rounding up. We're a little behind the hygienists, but we'll get there. We'll get there. I was gonna, yeah, and I was going to say, you know, I, that was in no way meant to take a shot at dentists, but you know, the practices where I think we see just the most success with implementing testing, and um, you know, just overall, it's when you have that great synergy with the dentists who are embracing. The hygiene department and embracing, you know, these newer technologies, it has to be both sides uh, is really what we find where when you have that great cohesion in the practice uh, and that great leadership from the dentist and then in tandem, great leadership from the hygienist, you know, that's when we, we see those practices that are just rock stars. Love it, love it. So what have been some of your more surprising wins along the way? Yeah, you know, I think that was one of the big ones. I think um, an, another real exciting one has just been the growing awareness of oral health um, in patients and in the public. Um, you know, it's it's growing. Um, definitely, we see, you know, I think the rise of functional medicine really uh, led people to start thinking a different way about their health and led to kind of the breakdown of silos of you know, at some point the mouth got removed from the body. It's great. It's being brought back in, in the sense of healthcare. Um, but you know, people are, you know, God health has raised to tremendous awareness. Um, and where does the digestive tract start? It starts in the mouth and for so long it's been ignored as a component of our health, but, you know, it's been really exciting to see people beyond just the oral health community really grasping onto the idea and, uh, I don't think it's a trend we're going to see slow down anytime soon. If anything, I think, uh, you know, a lot of those big name health podcasts and influencers are um, coming around to it. And I think we'll just see that more and more. So, so exciting to see, yeah. to see those guys doing, you know, interviews about nitric, nitric oxide and yeah. uh, yes, very exciting. Uh, mm -hmm. Huberman even talked about fluoride in the water. That was so cool. Yeah, uh, it's it's going the right direction for sure. For exactly. sure. Yeah. Soon enough, you'll be on Huberman and we'll all be better for it. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> uh, so what do you wish the public knew about oral health? Yeah, I mean, 
Uh, a few things, uh, you know, one, I think is that point you had really succinctly put that there's so many more tools at your disposal to address oral conditions than just brushing and flossing. Um, you know, I think it can be, uh, you know, you hear it all the time that I am brushing, I am flossing. People can fight over toothpaste ingredients and things all day, but you know, it really is, there's so many tools you can be leveraging to improve your oral health. And, you know, there's so many different things that can be influencing your oral health. Um, and, you know, oral health community is really leading the way in airway and proper sleep and things like that. So it is really cool to see, you know, get interested in the space, get interested in your oral health, you'll be much better for it. Um, and that leads into a good point that just how critical it is to your overall health. Um, you know, we were shocked when we were first starting Bristle and we dug into every condition it was associated with. You know, I think uh, Alzheimer's, adverse pregnancy outcomes, diabetes, heart disease, gut health, you know, there's associations um, across so many inflammatory conditions. Um, and, you know, while we don't have causal evidence across the board on these things, certain oral bacteria actively contribute to colorectal cancer um, aggressiveness and progression. And that's something that's pretty well studied, but not that well understood. And, um, you know, I think we're going to find more of that. And it's a real pain and a real menace because uh, it progresses silently. You know, gum disease can hit an irreversible state without really sending off warning flags, um, especially if we continue to be okay with this idea that bleeding gums are normal, which seems to be going around. Um, you know, it runs contrary, I think, to a lot of areas of our house where normally you'll feel something going wrong and then you can address it. Um, it's not the case with oral health. So you have to stay vigilant. Sometimes not, sometimes it's not, it's literally not felt until patients have loose teeth sometimes, mm -hmm. yeah. which by that time, there's very, very little that we can do to, yeah. to actually keep you from losing teeth. Um, not to mention all the other systemic health issues, like we talked about, I've been really, so I, I've known what the research has said for many years now, every year, there's more research that comes out about these links between poor oral health and systemic illnesses, specifically things that involve the inflammatory process and a dysbiosis. But what's been fascinating to see, and and I think any for any practitioner, for any person, it's just nice to see it more granularly. Um, my <laughs> sickest patients who are, maybe their oral health is not poor, um, but they come in the sickest. These are like my referrals from functional medicine doctors, from naturopaths, where they're like, hey, you've got to go see... Dr. Tony, um, these patients who have dementia, rheumatoid arthritis, whatever the case may be, they're super sick without fail. They all have really sneaky and terrible oral health markers. They've got a, a basically a jacked up microbiome, um, every single one. And with all of these super sick patients, it's, I'm, I'm calling the naturopath or the functional medicine doc and saying, Hey, you're spot on. We've got a, we've got an issue here. Here's how we want to deal with it. Let's work together. Um, so I would say, yeah, if you're, if you're one of those patients who you're having some chronic health issues that are, you're having trouble with that your healthcare team is having trouble with, then order a bristle test or, you know, go to the dentist along with your bristle test. Mm -hmm. uh, let's, let's make sure that we get these things in order because it is such a key component. Okay. Now for, for us dentists, what do you wish that dentists knew about oral health? I mean, I will caveat with dentists have forgotten more about oral health than I know. So I'm not going to stand here and lecture dentists about oral health. Um, you know, I think it's just the, you know, obviously I have bias in my approach, but I think a piece of it is just knowing that this technology exists and technology like salivary testing um, can really help give you meaningful insights. 
um, today. And, you know, it's, it, I think a shame in the oral health community is that there tends to be a lot of siloing too across, you know, I, we talk to a lot of people who are like, I'm not this type of dentist, but I want root cause insights. I'm not that type of dentist. I'm not that type of dentist. And, you know, let's just, you know, drop the labels a bit and really understand that, you know, this technology and getting to the root cause of things, there can be differences in how we're going to treat it and approach it. But, um, you know, really getting that other component, that other data point to incorporate with all the other things you're taking into consideration, which we know are so many things, um, can really help guide better care. And, you know, we see instances uh, routinely where patients will have things like abscesses or have recurrent gum issues and um, can be caused by something like serratia marsicans or one of these opportunistic pathogens that isn't that well understood as a contributor of oral disease, but surprisingly common where, you know, if people are using broad spectrum mouth rinses or broad spectrum approaches like antibiotics, these bacteria can really dominate the community. And instead of beating your head against a wall, using the same, like guessing at different treatments, if we can pinpoint that's the root cause, we can start to understand, okay, this is actually way more susceptible to xylitol treatment than manual interventions. So, you know, start to answer those questions, I think is the biggest thing. That's awesome. And I think that's a good <laughs> clarification too. Um, and so, and I apologize for not making the clarification sooner, but it's it, this test for dentist for dental offices is invaluable for any dental office and not just the weird woo woo girls like me who do biological dentistry and don't think that fluoride is the best health invention since sliced bread. Uh, this is, this is for every dentist. And you're, if you're a dentist who believes really strongly in pharmaceuticals and antibiotics, you can still use this and have an amazing impact on your patients because yes, there is a place for antimicrobials and pharmaceutical products in controlling the microbiome. And there's also a place for these other substances that can be gentler. Um, and it doesn't have to be the weird hippie woo woo stuff. It doesn't have to be ozone or essential oils. Like it, there's still, there's still room for everybody to play in the sandbox for sure. And it, you know, it, I, I think you've said it so well, and it's, you know, when we talk to people who are more biological or people who are more functional, and then the other people who feel the need to issue those caveats on things, Ultimately, everyone's just after better patient outcomes. It's really just, you know, what are you looking at? What are you open to in terms of willing to try and, you know, pursue those other different routes? Um, so I think there needs to be a lot more crosstalk. I feel like, you know, as you mentioned, sometimes if you'll mention antihydroxy appetite or concerns around different things, walls go up and there's not a great dialogue. And I think we really need to address that as a community and realize we're all here for the same reason. Just like... I will tell patients, you know, no, I can't, I can't tell you that these essential oils or oil pulling, or like, I can't tell you that there is peer reviewed research to support it, but I can tell you what has worked for other patients in my office and what works well in my hands, you know, what I'm using. Um, and so I'm, I don't hang my hat on everything needs to be evidence-based, um, but at the same time, like you can, you can say, okay, well, there are, there are many other things that maybe people in the more holistic community have not considered that is evidence-based. And it, I, I think there's, there's room for both. And I think it doesn't need to be necessarily a chasm between yes. allopathic and naturopathic between Eastern medicine and Western medicine there there's room for lots of crossover and lots of more integrative care where we can consider all options. And I think that's what the future is going to hold. You've seen it in, uh, outside so. healthcare and medicine where, yeah. you know, I have, I go to Kaiser and they're talking to me all about my diet instead of just trying to treat things with different medications they have. And, you know, I don't know that would have been the case that long ago. So you're right. You're right. Influences slowly, but surely. Yes.
Okay, so looking ahead to this year, it, we're recording this in January. So what is in store for Bristle in 2024? Yeah, so unfortunately, don't have any bombshells to drop currently, um, but we do have a lot of really exciting things coming soon. Um, you know, particularly focused on making the test more uh, intuitive and actionable for clinicians. Um, you know, I think a, a large frustration with salivary testing in general can be that question we were just talking about of what are the different things I can explore or what are the recommendations based on these interventions or based on these results. So we're doing a lot of user research and talking to people like yourself to really understand what are those opportunities to try and make the experience more intuitive, reduce any burden of interpretation or follow-up or um, meet, figuring out what to do with one thing or another. So um, a lot of really exciting stuff coming down the pipe on that front, hopefully in the very near future. Very cool. Very yeah. cool. So do you think everyone should do a bristle test and why or why not? Uh, you know, I do think everybody would benefit from a salivary test. Um, you know, uh, if I went to my primary care physician and they didn't run a blood test, I would find a new primary care physician because I know how much utility there is there. Um, and I think similarly, um, it can be very helpful, even if you're not actively experiencing symptoms, to know you're on the right track um, to see, you know, do I just not have an abundance of any bacteria because I've been wiping everything out frequently? Or do I have that healthy beneficial bacteria that's contributing to my beneficial oral health? Our, my overall health. So I do think everybody would benefit from it. Um, but, you know, right now, um, it's not financially feasible for every person. So I do think, you know, you have to figure out what makes the most sense for you. But I also want to, you know, we're hoping for action from leadership in the oral health community, um, you know, insurance companies, whether medical or dental, um, you know, any opportunities to try and make testing more accessible. We're doing our part. We will keep trying to innovate to make it more accessible. But, um, you know, I think the future, this will be standard of care. And, um, you know, the sooner we can get there, the better. Well, you said three words before I did, uh, <laughs> which I, I, what comes after making things accessible is making them standard of care. Yep. So I really think that that is the future. That should be your 10 year goal. Uh, or maybe your five-year goal is, yeah. you know, as CBCT <laughs> has now become the standard of care when placing implants and these more advanced dental treatments. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. A simple, easy salivary test could and should become the standard of care as we learn more and more about oral health. Agreed. Um, that's our North star. You got standard it. of care. I love it. Okay. All right, Brian, any parting words of encouragement or wisdom that you have for our audience that you would like to share? Uh, you know, I think in short, it's keep fighting the good fight. Um, you know, we get, I've mentioned this a few times, but we get so inspired working with people like you. And I'm sure many people in your audience who, whether as a proactive patient or as a proactive clinician are really the ones out there advancing the field with a patient centric mindset, which I think is so critical. Um, and I know it can feel like hitting a wall at times and, you know, trying to swim upstream, but we're really extremely optimistic about what the near future holds for oral health. We're seeing a rising awareness in patients and the role oral health plays in their overall health. I think that with the convergence of the technology shifts in thinking and patient awareness is going to yield some really exciting outcomes we're hoping for. And that future, I know you and so many others are building um, much sooner than I think what we sometimes worry about. Love it. Love it. All right. Keep fighting the good fight, everybody. Well, Brian, I so appreciate your time. Thank you so much for hanging out with us for a little bit. My it's pleasure. super exciting stuff. All of the things that, that Bristle is working on and the contribution, I think, to oral health as a community of practitioners um, and in oral health, 
just from a patient standpoint. So I'm so appreciative of you and your co-founders and are super excited to keep working with you and keep up with what all you guys come up with down the road. Thank you. The feeling is 100% mutual with everything you and your team have built at Flourish and with the podcast and you know, really expanding that message and that premise you all are building on. So couldn't have been happy to enjoy it. Love the conversation. I appreciate it. Appreciate it. All right, folks. Bye for now. We'll see you on the next episode.